coming up on Garden Talk. Fungal life moves in on things that it likes, such as fats and lipids, and avocado being one of the most fattiest uh, fruits out there. Just time and time again, I found that writhing ball of worms forming underneath a half an avocado. One of my favorite ingredients, pumpkin seed. Pumpkin seed is extremely high in phosphorus and uh, purees it beautifully into almost like a nut butter, if you will, and folds into that avocado really nicely. Use Bokashi to do an anaerobic breakdown of my product. I've I've tried thermophilic composting where you're trying to obtain you know a certain temperature to break things down. It works fantastically, and I'm having results that are amazing, honestly, with just maintaining my system that way. You'd be surprised how just a spoonful of certain things can really be sufficient to give you exactly what you're looking for. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 40. In this episode, I interview Blue of Green Tank. He has been gardening for 25 years and is the creator of Avocado Tech. He'll talk about what Avocado Tech is, how to implement it, and some things that closely relate to it, such as mulch layers, cover crops, and auto watering. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support... You can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Big shout out to Dutch Pro for sponsoring this podcast. Dutch Pro is a plant fertilizer company that has been around for over 30 years. They have base nutrients and they also have additives such as PK boosters, root stimulators, CalMag, silica, a nutrient optimizer, and a foiler feed. They also have pH regulators to help ensure that the nutrients can be uptaken properly. I will leave a link to Dutch Pro's Amazon store down in the description section below, and you can use coupon code MrGrow at 10DP for a discount on their products. Spider Farmer is a sponsor of the podcast. Coupon code MrGrow at 5 will get you a discount on their products. They're most known for their LED grow lights, but they also have other products such as grow tents, inline fans, and carbon filters. I've used their SF1000, SF2000, and SF4000 LED grow lights in the past, and I got some great results with them. I will leave a link to Spider Farmer's Amazon store down in the description section below. And don't forget to use coupon code MrGrow at 5 for a discount on their products. A big supporter of this podcast is AC Infinity. They sponsor this podcast, and I use their products. AC Infinity now has gardening tools and accessories such as heavy duty fabric grow pots, trimmers, grow room glasses, drying racks, plant ties, and trellis nets. They also have all of the equipment needed for a ventilation system. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below, and you can use discount code MrGrowIt during checkout for a discount on their products. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Blue of Green Tank. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? I'm doing good. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. You are well known for avocado tech, which is a very interesting technique. Super glad to have you on here today to talk to us all about it. We're also going to get into things that kind of work along with it, right? So cover crops, we'll get into mulch layers, auto watering, things that really kind of help with avocado tech in different ways. So excited to get into that before we get into the nitty-gritty and get deep into that part can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into gardening yeah what's up everybody thanks for having me on today um yeah i have been a hobby gardener for most of my life um and uh then um as i uh, progressed into a, a variety of different crops um medicinal plants became sort of a focus of mine uh and i looked for ways to um you know, streamline what I was doing, and that's really where the technique that I've shared with everybody else, um, particularly on Instagram, has uh, has come into play. And um, I uh, have been a uh, medicinal caregiver um, for a number of years, and um, before that, just a hobby enthusiast. And uh, now, um, looking in towards doing it as more of a profession, um, along with my other professions that I maintain uh, at the same time. 
So uh, I am a, uh, a wine and beer specialist. That's my family trade. Uh, I've been doing that for over 20 years now. Um, I started my journey uh, by going to culinary school shortly after high school. Um, so flavors and discerning products and things like that have been kind of my, my MO my entire professional career. And uh, this past year was able to open the first adult use um, a recreational store in my county um, in the state of Maine, um, which I'm excited to share with uh, the community at large. So that's where I am today. That's awesome. Yeah, before we start recording, you mentioned that you've been gardening for 25 years. So you have a ton of knowledge and it's not just medicinal variety, but you grow other types of plants. What are some of the favorite plants that you typically grow? Absolutely. Um, I've been into food crops. I mean, I like I said before, I have pictures of just being a little toddler in, in the garden, sitting around uh, Swiss chard and uh, you know, all manner of edible, uh, hardier crops. Uh, in Maine, we have a, a shorter, colder season, um, but a uh, big fan of uh, you know many different types of brassicas, all the tomato family. I've grown hundreds of varieties of tomatoes. Um, I have uh, you know zucchini, bush beans are a favorite of mine. Um, anything that's medicinal, edible greens, um, you name it, I'm interested in it. Nice, nice. So let's dive into avocado tech now. So that's what you're most known for. So tell us, what is avocado tech and how'd you come up with it? Um, avocado tech is essentially a method of maintaining a good uh, soil biology and also a manner to feed plants um, indirectly through soil decomposition. Um, I basically came up with it uh, through working in my own home garden, uh, looking for ways to streamline what I was doing. Um, I did not have a lot of infrastructure and ability to uh, compost during the cold months here. And uh, I started to kind of uh, think to myself, why can I not do this in container? And so I read more into, uh, you know, composting at the time and uh, started to come up with a way that I thought that I could uh, obtain what I was looking for, um, for uh, feeding the soil uh, and be able to do it all in container and not have to, you know, have worm bins or other infrastructure that um, that would have been a little more cumbers cumbersome in my situation. So that's how it kind of started. And, and then I kind of went down on a rabbit hole um, of uh, what I consider to be the fruit drop theory and also the law of return uh, as far as container gardening goes. And Basically, what fruit drop theory is, is that, you know, in the natural world, um, a plant will <clears throat> sacrifice a portion of its uh, reproductive nature to um, feed itself and the soil biology to maintain itself. And then um, the um, law of return is just simply uh, kind of goes hand in hand with that. It's, it's returning uh, a portion of what uh, has been cultivated back into the system and so that it can, you know, pr uh, maintain itself for uh, the next cycle. Okay, that makes sense. Now, can this technique be done in a non-organic system? For example, those folks that are out there using the synthetic bottled nutrients. Can you use avocado tech with that? Or? Um, I think that there are some um, aspects of it which could benefit that style of gardening. That's not my focus, of course. Um, I'm more of a living soil gardener. But um, what you could probably um, facilitate there would be... Um, bringing a little more biology into your system and also maintaining that biology source so that it continuously inoculates the system uh, even though the conditions aren't necessarily um, you know the best for that type of, of, of uh, biology when you see these videos of avocado tech happening you know whether it be on your instagram or there's a lot of people now on youtube that are doing it you know you pull out that pod and it's loaded with worms and different types of insects. Do you need worms and or insects in order for this to work? Um, I look at them as definitely the workhorse of the situation. Um, I would say that's a more complex or uh, and more beneficial aspect of it. Um, you know, the real heart of it is is that you're using microbiology to uh, aid in decomposition and. Um, at the end of the day, you could use fungal inoculants and bacterial inoculants to to uh, to break down uh, what you're choosing to to put into your uh, to put into your filling, so to speak. And we'll get to that later. Um, but worms, microarthropods, arthropods are definitely um, the workhorses of of the situation, and you will see the most um, the most complex uh, return based on usage uh, with those guys. Yeah. So there's several different types of worms out there. Which type of worms work best with this? Well, um, 
Definitely, uh, some of the, uh, the the faster uh, workhorses uh, would be red wigglers, which a lot of people know. Great composting worm works the surface of a substrate um, and tends to be pretty voracious. Um, but I also um, really like to push diversity in what I do, and so um, using European night crawlers, and now I've actually moved to using a little bit of the African night crawlers as well in a few different systems, and they kind of work different levels of the substrate, and they actually can even hand down um, material that's been worked by the other to the next, and uh, that can be really beneficial in a system, and, and again, uh, the diversity of the biology and, and moving um, you know, your inputs around within the soil substrate is definitely accomplished better when you have more workers in doing that. And I've even expanded to beyond worms as well um, through sort of happenstance, um, things like millipedes, um, even the uh, the woodlouse, which is so controversial. A lot of people call them pill bugs um, or um, isopods. Um, and uh, think there are organisms like that which will absolutely aid in the... Uh, the essential digestion of, of the ingredients that you're adding and, and get them into your soil system. So um, I would say that a, a broadcast is, is the best way, you know, get, it, get as many people, as many organisms doing the work for you as possible. Okay. I've seen a bunch of people do this indoors, you know, avocado tech indoors can also be done outdoors. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. There's probably a different set of rules involved. Um, of course, outdoors, um, you don't have the control, and so there's more organisms around, and they may want to jump in on the party. So it's very important to take into consideration where you're doing this, what your plot is like, um, what kind of you know flora and fauna you have in your area and that may or may not want to take part in this uh, this decomposition. And so there are some things you can do. Probably the most frequently asked questions are, um, you know, I have um, uh, rodents or have ants or I have, you know, some things that might, <clears throat> excuse me, be opportunistic and, and want to jump in on the party of decomposition, uh, whether it be just straight up eating what you've put down or tampering with it. And uh, there are ways to to uh, you know, help with that, I've suggested flat rocks to go on top of your avocado tech. Um, that helps protect it. I've also um, suggested folks, um, and I've practiced this myself, is um, submerge the um, pod, as I like to call it, um, a little bit uh, more down in the soil, and maybe even mulch over it. And that way, it's just not so obvious to um, you know organisms passing by. And uh, Another thing would be to really pre-inoculate your filling um, with some great fungal life, some voracious fungal life that may uh, just get that work going and get it done uh, before you're, you know, s essentially putting out bait for something to attract something in that you may or may not want. Um, so it can absolutely be done. Um, I did it in, uh, with success this past season uh, in a greenhouse that with, you know, doors open and, uh, you know, not really... Um, no other real safety measures to keep things away. And uh, again, with a rapid decomposition, I did just fine. Okay. Let's get into the process a little bit deeper. So, you know, how many avocados are you doing per plant or per container? Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I mean, it's probably best to backtrack of, of, of how I came upon this. And the regular process of learning composting, um, you take note of, of how things uh, break down in your system. Um, I've done a little bit of Bokashi, um, use Bokashi to do an anaerobic uh, breakdown of my product. I've, I've tried thermophilic composting where you're trying to obtain, you know, a certain temperature to break things down. But I really wanted to sort of stay away from both of those, both of those things because, um, you know, thermophilic composting can get too hot and can actually be detrimental to soil organisms and uh, Bokashi of course can also be uh, anaerobic which is not always a bad thing but if you can avoid it certainly um, it, it is a good thing to do um, but with avocados um, I noticed just through trial, trial and error that my worms were extremely attracted to the decomposition of avocados um, more so than any other thing that I kind of experimented with so that got me really thinking man like what, what is it with these guys what is it with avocados and um, what it really comes down to is that uh, you know fungal life moves in on things uh, that it likes such as fats and lipids and avocado being one of the most fattiest uh, fruits out there um, just time and time again I found that writhing ball of worms forming underneath um, a half an avocado um, I actually when I before I started it I had halved an eggplant in half and I was attempting to use an eggplant and I noticed that they gathered but they were they they were fleeting they would disappear um, after a while and so 
that led me to having the avocado and putting that down, and I just found that that dome um, of the shell of the avocado uh, kept it nice and dark and moist underneath there, there, and it was really kind of a situation that the worms loved, and so that led me towards the avocado. Um, and then beyond that, um, I had children that were young at the time and in high chairs, and uh, we used to sneak, uh, you know, veggies and foods that they wouldn't normally eat uh, to them through pureeing them. And so I got the idea of mashing some of these dry amendments that I would have liked to top dress with into this uh, guacamole of sorts, and then like a twice baked potato, putting it back inside the, and putting it down. And I found, you know, rapid decomposition of that, whether it be mechanical or or digesting through fungal life or worms or whatever it may have been so it just was uh it was hatched through observation basically um and since then i want to stress that there are many other dome fruits that you can use um in place of an avocado uh that work just fine but that avocado does have some secret properties for sure that the worms just love <laughs> so do you just apply one avocado per per gross cycle or multiple and when do you lay those down um, I really want to stress that more is less, so you need to be cognizant of where your soil is at. Um, I have people hitting me up all the time wanting to employ this um, technique, and I always, my first question is, uh, you know, what's your substrate? How old is your substrate? And nine times out of ten, these are people with a first-use soil, and I just want to stress that... Um, you know, you should be striving to build a complete soil to begin with. And if you're building a complete soil or you're purchasing a complete soil, um, it should be fine for one cycle. Um, when I like to start employing uh, avocado tech would be in the second uh, in the second cycle. That's not to say that you can't do it in the first cycle. I just think it's a little bit redundant. But people are always thinking more, 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 more. And um, so basically, what I like to do is um, I use one avocado, half of an avocado per plant. Um, I like to position it down near the stock, but not directly on it or touching it, not too close. And I use a drip emitter system, uh, a blue mat uh, style system that uh, drips on top of the shell of the avocado, maintaining the moisture. And I think that's really important. You can obtain the same thing by mulching it um, or just hand watering it frequently. But um, that's the easiest way for me because I get cons consistency. And what I have done through trial and error is timed... Um, putting down one half an avocado um, to complement three parts of the plant's life cycle. And so basically, um, I put one down in what you would consider the veg vegetative portion of the cycle, um, and I'll tailor what I fold into the um, avocado or other uh, dome fruit um, to the vegetative cycle. And then I will, I will do a second one um, it, about a week or two before I want to switch to um, uh, the flowering cycle and then I will use a third and final one about 20 days into the flowering cycle um, just to push um, push the ingredients that I would like to see being utilized in the soil um, at that time for ripening and for uh, uh, finishing and flavor and uh, secondary metabolites and terpenes and oils and whatever you, plant you're growing, you know, that you, you'd like them to, pr to produce. Make sure that, that uh, those um, ingredients are, are ample in the soil should the plant call on them. Okay. Now, I know in a, a lot of people that are in a living soil system, they're in larger containers, right? You know, 15 gallons is generally said to be the, the smallest container you want to be in. Some people are in 20 gallons. Some people are in beds. What container size do you suggest for this? And what's like the smallest container that can be used for this? Sure. Um, I would say that the rule of thumb, especially in living soil, is the larger soil container, the better. It just, it, it, there's more buffer, there's um, there's just uh, the ability to create a more complex system, in my opinion. Um, that being said, I have, uh, on my Instagram, uh, gone so far as to document containers as small as two gallons uh, with the avocado tech. And um, the reason being is this dome fruit uh, principle can really act as a hub to continuously um, keep the inoculation that you have, 
you know, um, tr that you've used uh, going in your system um, because there is that moisture, there is that continuous uh, breakdown um, that you have going, and it can really maintain a soil system um, in a in a quite a quite a small container. The only thing is, again, you don't have that buffering capacity, and so um, you know you are walking a bit of a tightrope as far as you have to stay on you know your moisture levels, um, you know, and you have to make sure that the organisms that you're using in there make sense. I mean, if you're using your European night crawlers that are, you know, you know, uh, six inches to a foot long. Um, it's going to get crowded in a two-gallon container pretty quickly, and uh, they're they're not going to probably be very happy. So um, you need to to be smart with that. And of course, um, you know, I prefer beds um, because I just feel that's the way you're going to get the most complex soil system going, and that's the way you're going to have the most longevity with the soil system that you're trying to create and and uh, make it easier to maintain the diversity, basically. That makes sense. Now, going back to the actual avocado, you had mentioned that there's sometimes this other amendments you added to like what you call, I believe, a mash, right? So what other amendments are you adding to the pod? I know you said you tailored it to the vegetation stage, and then you also kind of have your own thing for the flowering stage. Can you talk to us about what actually that consists of? Sure. Um, again, I mean, I'm going to kind of sound like a broken record in that diversity, diversity, diversity. Um, so... Uh, generally, I don't like to. Generally, I don't like to add, um, you know, too many things. But I like to bring sort of a focus. So in the vegetative stage, you're looking for maybe a bump of nitrogen. You're looking for, um, you know, a bump of calcium. Um, you're looking for maybe a, a few growth stimulants. Um, something like a kelp um, would be a nice ingredient to use at that point. But that's the beautiful thing about this: is sky is the sky is really the limit. And uh, utilizing soil testing can really help you hold, hone in on exactly what you may want to add. And again, this isn't, uh, you know, with organics, the um, the re the results aren't absolutely immediate so you have to be focusing on maybe a few weeks ahead um, and you know the best part of this vermicomposting that we're doing is that once these ingredients pass through the worm's gut uh, and some do and some do not um, some are mechanically mixed in just by the worm's body moving around but um, that, that, that they can be made plant available very quickly um, especially when you've been pre inoculated with some type type of fungi and bacteria that's kind of working it uh, you know uh, pre-digesting it in a way and then the worms coming through um, and eating the fungi bacteria and their byproducts and sort of really making it plant plant available even quicker so um, I use a mix and and I like to be smart and I like to use um, several different forms of the same ingredient sometimes sometimes I may use uh, gypsum dust for uh, calcium and I also may uh, mix in a little oyster flour um, you know, just to uh, oyster shell flour, excuse me, um, just to give a little bit of slow release. So there, there has to be a little bit of uh, uh, thinking ahead with this aspect. But other things I like to use, uh, malted barley is fantastic because the fungal life is really attracted to that as well. Um, you can add a sugar source if you like, although I like to, to really go low and slow on that, and we can get into why uh, uh, later. But um, you know your, your molasses, your agave. Um, there's a lot of different um, things that you can use to kind of um, spur the uh, microbial life popping off a little bit quicker, and also to sort of feed your inoculant that you choose. Um, indigenous microbes are fantastic, but you can purchase them as well. Um, uh, there's many, many varieties out there that you can use, but I like to use a good mix of a bio inoculant. Um, and then a couple targeted nutrient sources. So moving on to flour, you would maybe want a bump of, a continued bump of calcium. That seems to be a pretty consistent theme. Um, and then uh, moving into something like phosphorus. And uh, one of my favorite ingredients um, is uh, pumpkin seed. Pumpkin seed is extremely high in phosphorus and uh, purees it beautifully into almost like a nut butter, if you will, and folds into that avocado really nicely, as do uh, sunflower seeds. And you can get a great bump of phosphorus, you know, leading into when you might want to get into your branching and spreading out of your plants and, and really setting the stage for flower. Okay. Now, I know a lot of people are listening to this and they have living soil systems and they're wondering, is this the only thing you really need to feed 
your system throughout the grow? Is it, can you just do an avoc avocado and veg with your, your mash, with your amendments mixed into the pods, and also same thing in flour, and then that's it? Or are you also doing top dressing of different amendments throughout the grow? Well, I felt it was uh, really important when I was developing, you know, the, the, uh, the SOPs, if you will, uh, for this to attempt to grow completely with um, avocado tech. And that's kind of one of the more... I'm not going to say controversial, but it's a little more polarizing as far as um, people who are using it just for, uh, you know, propagation of worms and uh, ma maintenance of the worm population um, and even just maintenance of the biological population of the soil. And then there's the other side of actually completely feeding um, with that. And I think that it's a little bit more complicated when you feed solely with avocado tech, but it works fantastically, and I'm having results um, that are amazing, honestly, with just maintaining my system that way. You'd be surprised how um, how just a spoonful of certain things can really be sufficient to give you exactly what you're looking for um, in, in this type of gardening. Yeah, you mentioned that you, you're in a bed, and from what I've heard, you've been in that bed for quite a long time. So how many runs have you on now in that bed? I'm on my 15th cycle right now, um, and I have I have solely fed with Avocado Tech for at least uh, the last eight, and so um, I, I'm I'm attempting to prove prove my theory now. And um, not only that is there's there's a lot of other people out there. Um, just check out the hashtag Avocado Tech on Instagram, and you'll see a lot of folks who are who are using it and and proving the theory along with me um, with fantastic results. It's it's really kind of uh, cool to see. I'm not going to say that there's no other maintenance involved because that would be a lie, but um, you know that is the primary source of feed um, and for amending in my system. Yes, that's so awesome. That's great. Before we move on to, you know, auto watering, mulch layers, cover crop, you did mention that you've tried other fruits as well. Can you talk to us like about the other fruits you've used and kind of your sure. experience uh, using them? Sure. Um, you know, a big part of avocado tech for me and sussing it out in my own brain was t doing research on ingredients or, or on uh, different fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds um, that were high in specific uh, nutrient profiles. And so, you know, I was I was led early on to things like pumpkins um, and not only in the pumpkin seed, but the pumpkin itself, because it itself is a dome fruit as well. So there are a whole host of the curcubit family, which would be melons. Um, you know, squash, things of that nature um, that, that worked really well. And those were some of the first ones that I experimented with it after um, using the avocado. And, and part of that impetus was um, I wanted to move towards more regenerative, more uh, sustainable uh, ingredients that I could produce myself. I live in Maine. I'm not in an area that can support avocados. Um, and so I initially moved to try to work with my grocers, people that were throwing away culls, um, restaurants, things that were, you know, places that were that had overages or were not using them, um, rather than just going out to the store and purchasing something. Um, I wanted to reduce that carbon footprint. And so um, I found that, you know, the pumpkin seed works so well for me. How about, you know, working pumpkins? And of course, pumpkins generally being larger, um, weren't my, you know, weren't the, the best fit. But since then, I've, I've looked at using um, little sugar pumpkins. Um, I have used, um, uh, I particularly like spaghetti squash. I find that to be a fantastic source because it has that shell that you can, you know, uh, that, that you can use time after time, which is really nice. I've had, um, uh, experimented with coconut, um, which again, not, not grown in this area, but the husk on a coconut, uh, the shell works fantastic. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of some other ones I might've used, um, melons. I'm a big fan of, um, cantaloupe, uh, honeydew. Um, I have, I tried to grow some little mini midget, um, melons this year. Uh, there's musk melons. Uh, melons are a great source and particularly good in the latter um, uh, stages of uh, flowering because they are very high in potassium and have a lot of micronutrients. So they can be great for producing secondary metabolites and, and oils and such. 
Nice, nice. And then I seen way back on your Instagram, I think it was April 1st, you started using hot dogs. You want to talk to us about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one uh, got me into a little bit of trouble. So that was uh, obviously an April Fool's joke. Um, I took it a little over the top. I uh, went down uh, into my kitchen and got a, uh, a probe thermometer, um, a digital probe thermometer, and I actually put the probe into the hot dog and I made a little hole in the soil, uh, you know, before I started the video so that it was, uh, you know, perfectly laid trap ready to go. And I got this straight face on and, and I, 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 I did a post, um, you know, suggesting that I had found the, uh, the silver bullet of, uh, plant nutrition <laughs> and, uh, perfectly of course if you look at the video i perfectly placed the hot dog into the soil there's like you know no resistance it just perfectly goes in there and i i acted like this was some type of instrument that i was gonna uh you know measure if thermophilic composting started happening and things were getting too hot it would beep on a timer and let me know and it was a. Uh, the thing is, I, I, I really uh, got a lot of people hitting up my uh, DMs about uh, actually using it and <clears throat> kind of probably hurt a few folks' feelings when I explained to them that it was a, a load of BS, but yeah. I thought that, that was, was hilarious, yeah. You got me for a second. I was like, wait a minute, is that a hot dog? I was like, what is going on? And then I figured it out, right? As you kept on talking, I'm like, there's no way. Uh, I thought it was a brilliant April Fool's joke for sure. I mean, you can't take yourself too seriously, man. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm just looking for, um, you know, a method to maintain, um, you know, the soil that is easy and uh, is effective. And, uh, you know, you just can't be too serious about it. For sure. So let's switch it up. Let's talk about auto watering. You mentioned that you use the blue mat system. I also use blue mats as well. And I believe you're, you're setting up the carrot so it's dripping directly down onto the pod. So can you talk about kind of the auto watering system, how it works with Avocado Tech? Sure. Um, it is definitely um, one of the, the keys, I think, to optimize Avocado Tech. Um, I, I have uh, a greenhouse as well that I use the Blue Soak watering system as well. And for those who don't know, essentially, it uses this um, a tensiometer system, which is just basically it senses um, the water tension in your soil um, and will open up a valve when uh, the tension becomes low enough and releases more water and then as that soaks into the soil the tensiometer senses it and closes the valve and all the blue soak is is it's a, a, a soak tape that's uh, hooked to that and so you still you're still using the same mechanism to read the soil moisture it's just distributing it in a wider way um, and and a little bit more passive way I guess you would say um, I use both um, with avocado tech I do think I still prefer the straight carrot and drip system um, because I like the fact that it's dropping aerated water um, over this sort of dome and it's cascading down and uh, I just think you get a good aeration um, aspect to it as kind of like a secondary benefit um, and I think the worms really enjoy it as well. Um, that, that said, as long as you uh, employ uh, the blue soak and uh, mulch, I find that you get a very similar effect as long as you nestle um, you know, your pod, as I like to call it, um, you know, in an area where there's going to be ample water and the mulching just helps that facilitate that whole situation. Um, so yeah, um, it kind of, um, like I said, optimizes the whole setup. And I do feel like you can kind of uh, attain, um, some results that you might not be able to attain otherwise without it. So I really do recommend it. Okay. And then for mulch layer, what do you typically use? Uh, well, that's um, constantly evolving with me. Um, that's a, a it's, it's, that's a, a topic in itself. Honestly, um, I'm a big proponent of mulching. Um, one of the main reasons is retention of moisture in general, um, and uh, facilitating a zone that worms will like. And uh, we all know that you know where do you generally find worms? Flipping rocks, um, moving leaves aside. They they prefer dark, wet areas, and mulching just helps f facilitate that. Um, and, you know, the other thing is, is that in almost all soil systems or ones that I'm familiar with, at least, um, you know, there is a sort of changing of the guards as the seasons change as far as what what is acting as a mulch, um, you know, uh, grasses work fantastic, um, wood chips work fantastic. Um, I've even used mushroom, um, spent mushroom fruiting substrate. Um, 
which could be bran, it could be sawdust, it could be a lot of different things. Um, you know, but but what I do like to do is I like to um, have it kind of ever changing, and um, that comes from generally me reusing um, leaves and foliage from uh, the plants that I'm growing um, mixed in with some. So that would be my greens, and then um, my browns might be some some mulch or straw of uh, or mulch of wood chip um, or straw generally, um, and. Those, those seem to work really well and um, definitely facilitate the breakdown of the avocado tech aspect uh, faster. Because you're also a proponent of the chop and drop method, right? Can you, can you explain that method, what that is? Sure. Um, essentially what I'll do is, um, you know, I, cover cropping is, is a method of, there's several different ways to kind of do it, but you can get what they call essentially a green manure by uh, doing a green cover crop. And when you chop that down, um, and then I like to then again mulch over that, and that will really facilitate the breakdown of that green material. And w you'll really get um, a, a nice bump of uh, nitrogen and micronutrients into your system. So, um, you know, anybody who's into living soil um, has certainly heard of, you know, the clover usage of clover, um, vetch, there's a lot, I mean, there's a whole uh, list of things that would be really uh, uh, beneficial. Dichondra is another one that is very hot right now for people um, looking to, to sort of have a, a living uh, living mulch. Um, I sometimes take it a, a little step further because I'm in a smaller system, um, and so I will use uh, edible plants sometimes to accomplish the same thing. I may uh, do a... Um, patty pan squash or uh, a zucchini or cucumbers or something like that that are that are growing low and I'll time when I seed those into my system um, so that um, they they have ample light and are choked out by my target crop so to speak um, and th that is a, a great way to sort of cover the bases of of getting foliage down on the ground to create that moist dark zone that I'm looking for so um, I, I will incorporate that as well um, so it, it it's a ever changing, ever evolving thing with me. And I think that is part of the key to my success is that um, it is changing. And right now, for instance, my mulch layer is wood chip um, and it's just a, a hard wood chip. And um, I will then eventually seed um, um, some companion plants into that and sort of um, have it, you know, have it evolve again and then become a green lush kind of cover crop. So I like to switch it up. I think that putting in various browns and greens will just create diversity in your system. That's really important. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that you can actually, I mean, when you're pruning, right, a lot of people prune their plants for airflow purposes or for defoliation, for example. A lot of people just throw those away when really they can cut them up and put them right down onto the top of the medium, as it, use it as a mulch layer. You know, that'll break down and be available nutrients for the plant. And a lot of people don't know that. Well, I think there is a little bit of a misconception that that could be sort of a, a dangerous practice. And I suppose with the, um, you know, with the, uh, without some checks and balances in mind, it could be. Um, people are worried about, oh, well, if there's a, uh, if there's a fungi or a mold, so to speak, you know, eat, eating on this green material, well, then it must want to eat my plant. And that's not really how it works. Um, and, and I think it's important to just do your research on, on that. And again, the diversity helps as well, you know, just making sure that you're stacking the deck with organisms that you know to be beneficial. And that really won't leave a lot of uh, room uh, or word edgewise for uh, some of these uh, bad organisms to, to get established and get, get moving in your system. So that's another kind of key to that as well. Gotcha. Let's talk about environment conditions. I know that some people might think that the environment has a strong relation to it, right? So is there a specific environment that needs to be there in order for this to happen? You know, what should the temperature be? What should the humidity be? So on and so forth. Right. And that was, that's actually what I, I meant to touch on in what I was just speaking about in the last place is that if your environment is on point, it's going to actually work with you to kind of stifle some of those those bad organisms um, you want your airflow to be on point you want your temperature and humidity to be um, on point and you know for depending it, that entirely depends on what kind of crop is your target crop um, and what kind of plants that you're trying to really promote and sometimes you need to straddle the line between a couple different species to make everyone happy um, so you know in in the earlier vegetative stages, I like to run uh, more hot and wet, so to speak, um, and I'll get uh, my temperatures um, up around 84 degrees, um, and I will 
I'll go anywhere 70, 72 humidity, um, but not much up past that uh, with very good airflow incorporated in that and also very good air exchange. So I'm turning the air over in the space um, as quickly as I can. Um, and I think that's really important. That's where I'll see the most rapid growth. Um, and and I like to facilitate rapid growth because I am a, a scrog or screen of green grower and I, I grow with a trellis. And um, my uh, goal there is to spread uh, my canopy as far and wide as I can in, in as short amount of time as possible possible and what really facilitates that is higher temperatures and uh, and uh, also uh, higher humidity um, so that's a really important component to what I do and then as things progress I slowly back that down into a more reasonable range um, and I'll get into the oh as, as low as, and I, I'm talking daytime temperatures here I'm not as concerned um, with the swings in temperature day and night as long as they're kind of a gradual uh, shift I think that as with anything anything abrupt can can cause issues um, but I, I like to do it a, a slow and low so to speak um, and I'll back into the um, into the low 70s and I'll back my humidity uh, sub 60 um, humidity um, and again Good airflow, good air turnover, and I never ever have any issues. So that makes sense. That's, that's the sweet spot. Anything below sixty is really going to kind of stifle uh, growth of of uh, molds, mildews, and pathogens, things like that. Yeah, I mean, the, even the beneficial bacteria is going to slow down movement as the temperature gets sure. lower, and that'll uh, of yeah. course slow down breakdown of the nutrients and, and negatively have to impact the plant. So, and that that kind of brings to a broader topic as well. Is I like to say that I'm uh, striving to uh, instead of having a Lamborghini or a Ferrari as my soil, I'm looking more to have a car go van um, <laughs> as as my vehicle in my soil um, and I and I'm able to throttle it again with that temperature and humidity a little bit of how fast I can go but um, really a, a slower more even breakdown and decomposition um, seems to be much more beneficial in staving off any kind of uh, nutrient hunger or um, what I call rapid growth deficiencies which um, I grow with LED lighting and uh, you can really rev up the metabolism of the of your plants um, Th through f not only feed but environment and so I think it's really important to sort of have uh, a, a lot of diverse tools available in the back of your cargo van than it is to have your two-seater that can you know zoom but runs out of gas really fast and uh, that's where I find a lot of people in vermicomposting even and in living soil run into issues with their soil becoming you know primarily castings and such is because that that engine is is revving at too high um, a speed and the uh, the system just can't keep up in this and the organisms in the system can't keep up and then in turn your plants can't keep up in a broad sense yeah and speaking about that you know that that's certainly a problem avocado tech you explained it seems pretty easy right just by the way you explained it and you know you can put it down but people have to become across problems every now and then so what problems can people potentially come across doing this method and how can they not come across those problems in the future Sure. Um, I think there's a little bit of an intuitive aspect in it, but if um, that aspect eludes people, there's always me. And I find that I, uh, I answer a lot of questions on a daily basis, a lot of questions, and I try to get to everyone. Um, and there's certain questions that I just kind of politely flatly refuse to ask and that's a lot of plant diagnosis but um you know what's this problem what's this look like to you what do you think this is um and i don't like to do diagnosis from afar because it would just be um it would it, it would be silly of me to try to do that because I can't see every factor and I really can't take the time to suss out every factor of everybody's question. Um, but um, some of the problems that I see people run into are um, they don't take into consideration that they're adding dry amendments to something that's moist and um, in the same principle as cement, you know, it's a dry mix and you add liquid to it. Um, the reverse happens as well. You take something that's, that's liquid and you add something that's a, a dry uh, powder or solid to it and it will absorb moisture and so the problems that I've seen in some people's systems asking me why the worms aren't you know balling up underneath and congregating would be that they've added too many dry amendments and then it is 
pulled the moisture out of it and therefore is uh, kind of uh, messed with the texture. Um, and texture is important to the worms. They, again, want an, uh, an atmosphere that is moist. And uh, if you're kind of mixing up a dry quick cement, um, it's going to get pretty unappetizing to them. Not to say that it won't break down over time and not to say that the fungal element won't move in and break it down over time, but it just won't be that, that seamless breakdown and that really, you know, sort of um, dynamic situation going on underneath your pod. So mainly it's been that. Um, the only other thing I can think of is that um, people have... Um, no, I haven't seen any problems arise from it, but I've had people say that they've had pods that they thought went anaerobic because the aromas, the smells um, that were coming from it were not necessarily appetizing. And one thing I explained to them is decomposition is not built for, you know... Uh, the human nose to be pleasant. Decomposition, you know, can put off all kinds of, of aromas that uh, might not be your favorite. Um, and that's why I really suggest for people um, to use something like a Bokashi, which has the the particular microorganisms that will deal with uh, with a anaerobic or um, aerobic kind of situation underneath the pod and can really help break things down and, and you won't see anything... Um, you know, too detrimental in your system. So never seen uh, anything that's that's been a big problem other than it's sort of not living up to uh, the standards that I show on uh, on social media. That's good to know. What advice do you have for growers who are just getting started with avocado tech? Now, I know you went over so much advice throughout this video. Is there anything else that you can think of? One would be, um, you know, take it, take it slow. Um, the avocado in itself is perfect feed. Um, there really is no reason to load it with everything but the kitchen sink. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful um, feed when it breaks down by itself. And so if you have a young system, a system that's not particularly mature, just have an avocado, take a fork, mix it up, and again, use a ripe or rotting avocado. I love to let it sit out until it rots. You get some free microorganisms already working on that thing, and uh, you can really... Um, you can really still benefit your system just using a plain avocado. So I would say that's the way to start. You know, there's no real investment other than obtaining that that fruit and uh, and, and giving it a try. And then after that, you know, uh, use the amendments that you decide to add in sparingly. I think that you would be shocked how much a teaspoon or tablespoon of some of these dry amendments can really influence your soil system. And again, when it's right underneath that plant, you know, you're really targeting that one plant in that system um, in that rhizosphere where all that biological interaction is going on right there next to your roots. And that's the really the most important part uh, and place where you want to have that go on. Awesome. So wrapping things up, how can listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Uh, you can definitely find me on Instagram. Um, Instagram is where I do, um, you know, uh, most of my educational aspect of, of what I do and also just kind of broadly showing you what I'm up to. Um, and so that is the at uh, blue underscore of underscore green tank, one word. Um, and you can always search avocado, hashtag avocado tech, um, and that will bring you to most of my posts. Um, uh, have that attached to it as well as many other growers that have that attached to it. Um, what I have coming up in the future is um, my new business venture is um, Mary Stem LLC and that is an adult use um, retail shop and my um, my aim is to um, not only work with some of the best and brightest farmers here in Maine and showcase what their potential is um, but I would like to parlay that into a small house brand of my own um, which will utilize avocado tech to feed um, you know, some of the plants that I will uh, hopefully be able to get into the adult use market in the future. That's exciting, man. Congrats on your new yeah, venture thanks. there. Thanks. Thanks. It's, it's been great. So I will link Blue's Instagram down in the description section below. If you enjoyed this video, click that thumbs up button. Try to get as many likes as we can. That helps with the YouTube algorithm. Comment down below. Let us know what you think of Avocado Tech. Will you be trying it in the future? Let us know. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And if you're on Apple Podcast, please leave a rating and review. Uh, coming up to 200 ratings and reviews, although the amount of ratings and reviews have kind of slowed down a little bit. So for those of you listening on Apple Podcasts, please take a minute to leave a rating and review. Help us get to our goal of 200. Blue, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast today and teaching us about your technique, Avocado Tech. I know this has been uh, very insightful for me, and I know my audience is really going to gain a ton of value on this one. So thank you once again, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. 
Awesome. Thanks for having me. All right. Cheers, everybody. Peace.